Welcome to this node breakdown for Mardini 2024 with Grayscale Gorilla. This is day 17, and today's node is the Flip Solver Sob. So inside of Houdini, we have the Dynamics context. If we go ahead and drop a .NET, you can see that we have the Dynamics context. Recently, SideFX has been creating sub-level nodes that give us access to dynamic solvers. So one of these is the flip solver. So we can go ahead and just drop a flip solver. This over here does contain a dynamics network, but what it allows is for us to work at the sub-level. And with this comes a bunch of tools. The first one that we're going to look at is the flip container. This over here is going to set up the base bounds for our flip solver. You can see that it requires these three sources and the flip container will provide that. So once we do that, all conditions are met and it's happy, but it doesn't actually do anything yet. It does solve, you'll see the blue bar for caching, but we really don't have anything going on. This flip container sets up a bunch of the settings that you may be familiar with, such as particle separation and a domain. The domain is what you're seeing over there. When we're solving, anything that falls outside of the domain will just be culled from the simulation. It also contains our settings for density, surface tension, viscosity, and other attributes. Now, the actual flip solver over here has things like particle separation grayed out because it will be fetching it from the flip container. Of course, you can also explicitly specify it by enabling it over here. One thing that we can do is add a waterline. And so this is going to be dependent on the actual size of our flip container. If we reduce the size to something like five, you'll see that it narrows it in like this, and we don't really have anything going on. Now, what you can do is you can add a collider to this. So what we can use is a flip collide. And what's cool about this node is that you just slot it in over here and then just choose the collider that you want. So let's just go ahead and use a rubber toy and a transform. I'm going to keyframe its position over here, right? So we now have this over here and we can just plug that into the flip collide. If we take a look at what the flip collide is actually doing, it will generate a volume based on these inputs. Once we feed that into the flip solver, what you'll have over here is an incoming collider, right? So this can now collide with the water level that we created. And there you have your flip collision. Now that's just a collider with a water line. If we don't have a water line over here, then we may want to source something in. And what you'll see over here is the fourth input over here says boundary flow. Now this boundary flow over here is a way of sourcing things in. And we can actually use this if we just drop a sphere and plug it into boundary flow. What we'll have is a sphere that drops as we start our simulation. But this isn't a very useful way of sourcing into a simulation. So the better way of doing this is to actually use the flip boundary node. So we have flip boundary, plug it in over here. And this node is useful for either a sink or a source. So I'll show you a source first. If we just plug this in over here, then this will continuously source. All right, so it's now continuously sourcing. So just like that, we have a collider and we have a source. So that's the one type of flip boundary. Now I want to show you the other type that we can use, which is a sink. But firstly, I'm going to go over to the flip solver and we can look at the collision tab. Over here, we have a ground plane that we can activate just like this. And if you expand this, you have options for its height. So I'm just going to drop its height just down over there. This is where we're going to look at a sink. Let's go ahead and use a flip boundary. Let's create a tube. And this tube over here, we just want it to kill all the particles that fall outside of it. So I'm just going to increase the radius over here and increase the height and something like that should do. Now, when we plug these geometries into flip boundaries, they actually get converted into volumes. You can see that the sphere gets converted into a volume over here. And this tube is going to be converted into a volume as well. But for that to work, we need thickness. So let's go ahead and use a poly extrude, increase the thickness of this, I'll put a back face, and now we have a flip boundary. You can see it over there. Now it does fall outside of our bounds. So let's increase our container size. Now for this to work, we just have to change this flip boundary from a type of source to sink. So now what will happen is any particles that come in contact with that sink will be removed from the simulation. You will see that some particles occasionally escape and that's just gonna be a matter of things like substeps and the actual thickness of your sink. So we still have many of the settings that we usually would have access to with a regular dot network. For example, air incompressibility, that'll be useful for creating rising bubbles in the example of something like a water tank. Over here, under the enforced particle separation, this is just going to be useful if your particles are collapsing in on themselves and you're losing volume in a fluid. You have detect droplets, which is a useful way for detecting any sort of particles that are moving away from the main mass of particles. And then you also still have the velocity transfer up here. You can have splashy or swirly. Splashy encourages splashing in a fluid. Swirly encourages that swirling motion in a fluid. Over here, we have visualizations. Generally, I would switch off points as spheres because it does actually slow down the visualization slightly. And so now you can see that that's what we have. 
And then finally, under the advanced tab, we have particle narrowband. That's just going to be useful if we're using that water line that we looked at earlier. You may want to have narrowband so that it doesn't actually simulate all of the particles beneath the surface. Finally, the last thing that you may be interested in is actually adding attributes to a particular geometry, right, to a particular source. So let's just say that we have the source over here, but we would actually like some attributes to be brought into this. So over on the sphere, I'm going to go ahead and switch this to a polygon and then increase the frequency to something like 50. And I'm going to increase its size to something like two. So with this over here, we can add things like viscosity. So let's use an attribute noise. We will set this to viscosity and it'll be a float. Let's just visualize it, enable the remap range, something like that, and then set the amplitude to something like 1000. And then we'll just post process it down here so that we have a minimum of 0.1. This is just going to ensure that we don't have any zero values. Now, if we go down here to our flip solver and try playing this back, you'll see that it doesn't actually respect those settings, right? We don't have any viscosity. That's because we have to go over here onto our flip container and we just have to go over to viscosity and enable it. We also just need to enable varying viscosity over here. And now it'll be able to have variations in our viscosity and it'll fetch it from this over here. So now you can see we have a thicker fluid. This is going to be the same situation with density. Of course, you can go over here and just add your density, once again, enabling varying density. This will allow you to have separation in your fluid simulations where low density particles rise to the top and heavier particles sink to the bottom. So just like this, we can set up a simulation. And then if you were to output this, all you would use is a fluid compress. This is just a way of reducing the size that this takes up on disk. So once we've compressed it, you'll have this over here. And then you would file cache the actual output, which is the first output over there. So this would get output to disk. And then you would use a fluid surface, particle fluid surface over here. Once again, taking all three as inputs, right? So we have that over there. And again, this will actually fetch your particle separation from the flip solver. So if we go ahead and just change the particle separation on our flip container, you'll see that the resolution of this down here also changes. So that's how we might go about setting up an entire flip solver network using the flip solver node. An important thing about this node is that a lot of our settings may exist on the actual node, but much of our simulation data is going to be coming from these other nodes. So the flip boundary for a sink, the flip boundary for sourcing, a flip collide to add colliders, and the flip container over here to set up the initial bounds and initial settings for the simulation. Another thing to take note of is that double clicking on this node gives you access to forces and you can use things like a pop wind. So let's just increase this amplitude over here and you should see our fluid kind of being blown about, right? So you can add forces like that. If you are more of an advanced user, you can also unlock this node. So you can go over here, right click, allow editing of contents. And inside of here, if you just press control F and search dotnet, you'll be able to find the dotnet over here, All right? So this is for more advanced users if you want to go in and actually make changes to the dotnet itself. Do note that if you do that, the next time you double click on this node, it'll take you inside instead of to the forces. So now you'll have to go inside here and just go find the forces, right? Just like that. So that's it for this flip solver node. Fortunately for us, SideFX has also included a bunch of nodes for us. If we just type flip configure, you'll see that we have a configure flip we have configure lava, configure tank, configure beach tank, configure ocean layer, configure wave tank. All of these will give you more information about how to use this node. For example, if we drop lava, you can see that this over here uses temperature as well as varying viscosity to create a lava type simulation. But fortunately now, after what I've shown you, this should all make sense, right? We just have a sphere with a temperature being fed into a flip boundary with enabled viscosity, and then we just have a lava simulation. Right, and all you're seeing over there is an angled ground plane. You can see it right over here. And so I would recommend going through all of the different presets that Houdini offers. You can learn a lot from them as long as you understand this basic setup of a flip container with a collision, a source, a sink, and the rest of our settings existing on here, going between waterline and narrow band for tank solving, or disabling this and just sourcing in with a flip boundary. So that's all for this video. I do hope you found it useful. The next video will be the start of week four and we'll be looking at the Apex Animates up. So thanks for watching. I'll see you then.